I'm going to go ahead and sit at the lectern. Good evening, uh, and welcome to the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening, where we anticipate a really fantastic debate um, about uh, uh, international criminal trials. My name's Dr. Steve Hopgood from the Politics Department, and I'm going to chair this evening. I'm going to run through a few housekeeping things, first of all, then introduce our panelists and give you some idea of the format, and then we'll get underway as soon as possible. Housekeeping. Uh, this is a list that's printed out for me rather than something I've come up with. Uh, fire evacuation. Please <laughs> notice your nearest exit now. There are no floor lights to guide you, I'm afraid. Um, one fire exit there, one fire exit over there. Uh, if the fire alarm is a continuous uh, ringing bell, um, uh, and if there is a fire, well, I'm sure there won't be, but if there were to be, please exit the building and then move away from the central quad between the two buildings to the right or the left. Mobile phones, please. Could you make sure they're all turned off? Um, at the end of the uh, presentation and discussion uh, section, there'll be 40, 45 minutes for questions. There'll be a roving microphone. So I'll ask for questions from the audience. Someone will bring you the microphone. Please wait for the microphone to start talking. Um, I'll also I'll, I'll encourage you to be succinct when it comes to microphones, uh, when it comes to speaking into the microphone, and I'm going to be a pretty tough chair if, it, uh, if we get into too many long speeches from the floor. Uh, male and female... Uh, Toilets are just outside that. This is the list I was given. Men and female toilets are just outside the door, uh, just through there. You probably found them. Uh, and uh, the audience is asked to remain seated um, until the panel has left the platform. I don't quite know why, whether it's that there's a, a danger they'll be attacked on the way or you'll throw fruit or something of that sort. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to introduce our four panellists. Uh, first of all, Marty Koskinyemi, who's uh, uh, second from your right over there. Professor of International Law at the University of Helsinki and Director of the Eric Kastren Institute of International Law and Human Rights. He's one of the world's foremost critical legal scholars, having published many influential articles, including one, uh, of course, related to tonight's event in particular, called Beyond Impunity and Show Trials in the Max Planck yearbook in 2002. He's best known to scholars of international relations and international law as the author of The Gentle Civilizer of Nations, The Rise and Fall of International Law, 1870 to 1960. But he's also held senior posts in the Finnish diplomatic service, including director of the International Law Division. And from 2002 to 2006, he was a member of the International Law Commission. There are many, many other of Marty's achievements I could read out, but that's just a few to introduce him. And he'll be speaking first for about 10 minutes. He'll be followed by Stephen Kay, who is a barrister and QC at Nine Bedford Row, and is perhaps the most experienced defense counsel in the world on cases involving international criminal law. Among the main high-profile cases on which he's been defense counsel, two stand out in particular to me. He represented Dusko Tadic in the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague, in 1996-1997. And of course, this really was the first international criminal trial uh, since the Second World War, since Nuremberg and Tokyo. Uh, uh, this is where the uh, sort of international justice um, uh, uh, program began to really galvanize itself again. Uh, and from 2004, he was the lead defense counsel for Slobodan Milosevic uh, at the ICTY until Milosevic died of a heart attack in 2006. And Stephen had also been involved with that case before then as well. He's also currently defense counsel for the Kenyan Deputy Prime Minister Uhuru Kenyatta, who, as many of you all know, is charged by the ICC prosecutor with crimes against humanity. So we're very um, happy to welcome Marty and Stephen tonight. Once they've both spoken for about 10 minutes, there'll be two um, responses or um, uh, questions from uh, our other panelists. First of all, Robert Mertfeld, who's on the far right there. Robert is a PhD student in international law at SOAS, whose work begins looking at the uh, alleged genocide of the Herero in German Southwest Africa, now Namibia. Um, but his research also takes in much wider international justice themes. 
He's a co-founder of the Center for the Study of Colonialism, Empire, and International Law at SOAS, and has been a visiting research fellow at Columbia University in New York. And I should say, and I'll thank him more uh, fully at the end, but really this entire event, which has been a mammoth effort of organization, is really um, principally down to Robert um, putting it together and organizing it. But I'll ask for a, a thanks for him, particularly at the very end of the evening. And immediately on my left here, Polina Levina was, was born in Moscow and grew up in Canada and the United Kingdom. She's currently doing her master's in international law at SOAS. Prior to that, she worked for 18 months in the office of the prosecutor at the ICC in The Hague, where she worked on the Kenya case and was also involved in the preliminary examination of situations in Nigeria and Afghanistan. So I think you'll agree we have an extremely experienced and knowledgeable um, and interesting panel to listen to tonight. The format's as follows. Marty and Stephen will talk for 10 minutes each. Robert and Polina will have a five-minute um, uh, opportunity to ask them a few questions and discuss a few things. Then we'll have a little uh, debate um, between members of the panel, but pretty quickly we'll move on to questions from the audience and we'll start the roving mic going around. Okay, so thank you very much, and we'll begin with Marty Koskiniemi. Marty, thank you. I'm really sorry I'm not speaking French. I'm really sorry I'm not 87 years old, have a white <laughs> hair and a fat cigar. But I still think every trial is a political trial. We don't always feel that. When we pay parking tickets, we do that without thinking. Every trial is a political trial and a show trial because every trial represents a power, a hierarchy, a set of values and preferences. When we pay the parking ticket, we express our agreement to the hierarchy, to the set of values and preferences. We don't think that our rights have been tremendously violated by the powers that be. We understand or think we do the reason for why we do this. Sometimes we don't feel the same way, however. There are other kinds of applications of criminal law trials in which we feel that something else is going on. The famous or infamous Vyshinsky trials in the 1930s in uh, the Soviet Union, or the present trial of Judge Balthasar Garzon in Madrid. We feel that something else is going on there than just paying uh, parking tickets. In the latter types of case, we feel not only is the accused probably innocent, but it may be that the court is guilty. And not only the court, but the system that the court represents. There are many such cases where we feel this in history. Think of the trial of Socrates. What if Socrates had said, no, no, yes, it's true, dear uh, elders of Athens. I did say those words, and I now recant. I, I apologize to you, uh, the elders of Athens. Well, we would feel disappointed. There wouldn't be too much drama. And the elders of Athens would have won. But Socrates didn't do that. Socrates said, well, I t told his accusers, I am guilty of what I'm accused of. I drink the poison. Who won in that trial? Do we remember who were the elders of Athens? In legal training, lawyers are not always taught to make a difference between parking tickets and Socrates. That clearly must be a terrible mistake in training lawyers. In 1968, the white-haired, now 87-year-old French radical lawyer wrote La Stratégie Judiciaire. In that book, he pointed to a distinction, a distinction that I think, and, uh, and I tell my students, is something you will have to remember through your lives. This is what uh, Jacques Vergès calls uh, the distinction between a trial of connivance and a trial of rupture. A trial of connivance is such that you accept the world of the court. You accept, broadly speaking, the frame in which the prosecution operates. 
You accept that, yes, uh, she was killed. Yes, she had a knife in her back, but I was on a train at that time. I couldn't have done that. So you connive in the overall setting. In the criminal system, the only thing you say, well, I didn't do it, or my client didn't do it. Socrates didn't act in that way. Socrates didn't connive in the system of the Athenian elders. Socrates was engaged for the first time in a trial of rupture, saying, it's not really me who's to blame here, me who am accused. There have been other cases, and this little book quite usefully uh, lists some of those. We could add the trial of Dreyfus, of course, from the French realm, Perhaps the trial of Lieutenant Kelly, the Milai trial in the United States, in the list as well. We would certainly add the trials of the Algerian freedom fighters during the Algerian war. Could we add the trial of Klaus Barbie? The white-haired Frenchman behind the cigar would say, yes, obviously. Why? Well, bec because we weren't exceeding we weren't uh, accepting the frame the prosecution offered to us. The prosecution, of course, offered the frame of the Second World War, the Holocaust, la, uh, the heroic actions of the, La Résistance. Jacques Vergès knew that Klaus Barbie could not have been acquitted. In this sense, it wasn't obviously a show trial. What is a show trial? A show trial is one in which everybody knows that the, that the accused will not be acquitted. So you do something else. Like what? Well, for instance, you show that the acts of which Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, was accused of when he tortured Jean Moulin to death was, were exactly the same actions that the Algerian um, military used during the time of the Algerian independence war. That's an important point to make. Nuremberg. Nuremberg wasn't about parking tickets either. There was a new order that was being demonstrated. But there was some uncertainty about what that new order was, linked to what sort of criminal was Hitler and what kind of criminality did the Hitler regime have? In his two and a half hour speech, the French prosecutor Francis de Menton mentioned the oppression of the Jews once. When the reel that was famously shown when the um, uh, concentration camp at Bergen-Belsen was opened and the, the uh, famous mass graves were shown, the British bulldozing, uh, the, the graves open, the real spoke of crimes against civilians. When that same film was shown in the Eichmann trial in 1961 in Jerusalem, the same film, the voice had been changed. And now the voice spoke of the Holocaust of the Jews. Trials can be used to show many different things. And different prosecutors have interest presenting things differently. What was being shown in the Milosevic trial? In, the, in her opening speech, the prosecutor, Carla del Ponte, said in a way that we perhaps understand that not the whole nation is on trial. Only one individual is Milosevic. We understand, of course, she didn't want to give, create the impression that the whole of the Serbian nation was on trial. But how, how true is it that the atrocities were the result of the actions of this one man? What was being put on show there? What was the context that was being shown to the Western media? And why, why on earth did she not choose to prosecute the NATO bombings of uh, Belgrade in 1999 as well. So there are always choices to be made, and I, I'm sure my colleagues will be discussing those choices. I'm happy to discuss. There are always truths to tell, and show trials are about telling the truth. The show trial, of course, depends on the actions of the accused. When Churchill first heard 
that there would be trials at the end of the Second World War. He was puzzled and worried about this and said, no, no, just put them against the wall, all of them. Why would he think that? Churchill, we would admire the man. Well, he knew the great paradox that he was facing, that the Nuremberg prosecutors were facing, that the French prosecutors, when they believed that the story to be told was only the story of La Résistance and that there's no story about Algeria at all, that Carla del Ponte thought that there was just one story. The paradox that Churchill knows, knew is this. If you let the accused speak, there's no telling what the accused might say, and it might be very indicting. But if you gag the accused, if you don't let the accused speak, then you're engaged in a show trial. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marty. Show trials. Um, international criminal justice has come a long way since Nuremberg. Nuremberg is no longer the standard for international criminal justice. Nuremberg has been consigned to history. Nuremberg remains a platform upon which people go to look at principles to see how they applied the new international criminal offences which they discovered at Nuremberg, crimes against humanity, etc. That is a place where the academics go for the arguments, for the philosophy, and for the points of view, and regard what took place in Nuremberg as something that could not take place under modern conditions. But are show trials a good thing? Do show trials achieve justice? Is the international community at times in pursuit of the new area of law, international criminal law, often finding itself involved with show trials in a way that they do no credit to victims, they do no credit to justice, and they do no credit to history. Uh, let's first of all take the Milosevic trial. Uh, the Milosevic trial was originally going to be on one indictment, Kosovo. He was indicted upon Kosovo during the NATO bombing of Serbia in 1999. Before 1999 and after Dayton, there had been no question of Milosevic being charged with anything in relation to the Yugoslavia wars between 1992 to 1995. So what happened? He was indicted by Louise Arbour during the middle period of the NATO bombings of Serbia and at a time to weld public opinion against Serbia and Milosevic, and in the clear understanding that all academic as well as legal advice at the time was that the NATO bombing of Serbia in the bid to wage a war against Serbia and Milosevic was illegal. There was no authority under the NATO Charter to bomb Serbia in relation to its conduct of its affairs 
over Kosovo. NATO's charter only gave it the authority to go to the defense of another NATO state, and Kosovo was not a NATO state, and thereafter act in self-defense of a NATO state. And how complicit were our leaders and our politicians and our institutions in Western Europe with this particular plan. They were greatly complicit and they invented for themselves a, a new principle of, of the right to protect. Actually, that came two years later at a conference in Skaveningen when they were very worried about what they'd done and they decided to get a load of academics together to invent a defense for the NATO countries. And that happened in 2001. So from that moment on, you had all the beginnings of a NATO attempt to get out of trouble and the use of a show trial against someone who was to be brought to justice. Uh, did that serve international criminal justice the best way? I'll leave you to answer that question. Uh, but when that first trial over Kosovo started, uh, added later were the indictments concerning Bosnia and Croatia. Uh, they came in the November of 2001, four months after Milosevic had been arrested and two months before his trial was due to start for Kosovo. The trial chamber ruled that he should only be tried on Kosovo, on one matter, deal with this simply. But what happened? The prosecution wanted a massive show trial of all three indictments together, full of evidence that any criminal lawyer was able to say was not necessary to prove the charges. And so the show trial that developed around Milosevic then had to be spun that somehow he was doing something wrong or we were doing something wrong by playing them at their own game. Uh, and the number of articles I read in the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, and other respected journals, the Times, I think they're here tonight, uh, which reflected that kind of attitude, actually were really recycling the propaganda and points of views of the institutions and the politicians who'd caused the trouble in the first place. One thing Milosevic and the prosecution agreed upon together, the only thing, was that they should have a joint trial. I got it wrong at first. I applied for one trial and severance. And he told me, no, joint trial. So I had to backtrack on the filing that was submitted. So there we are. That's a big name case where there's to be a show trial. Um, let's look at what happened yesterday. Special Tribunal for Lebanon. It's been in a building for five years in Holland, kicking around lots of jobs, lots of judges, lots of expenses, lots of investigators, about a thousand people there, one big courtroom, all lovely jubbly, everyone getting on nice payroll, and there's no one there. They haven't had anyone there. Their whole investigation was a complete failure and they had to redo it. Originally, it was going to be against Syria. We had all that for two or three years. Uh, and then they discovered the evidence when they investigated for the third time uh, at targets that they wanted to bring cases against. All very well and good if you've got the people there. But these people aren't even there. No one knows even if they're alive. They could be dead. Uh, but yesterday, 
announced was that there was to be trials and absentia of four of those people. Uh, is that a waste of money? Um, is that serving justice victims? What's all that about? Um, and to put it as an announcement by the court, they've been planning it for months. They've been interviewing people for jobs. They've been putting together defense teams. So they've known what they're going to be doing. It's not a question of suddenly the judges coming out of a, a white room where they've had nothing to do with anybody coming to uh, an earth-shattering conclusion that trials and absentia are the way forward for everybody. Not at all. An entirely self-serving justification of an institution for which I can see no point at all. Um, allowing, as international criminal justice has, um, this crusade against impunity to be such a major force and something you're taught about in, in the halls of uh, academia um, has become a very dangerous thing indeed. Um, I don't know how many of you are well versed in the laws of Bangladesh, uh, but if you go to their International Crimes Tribunals Act of uh, 2009, amending the 1973 Act, you'll find there the most revolting and utterly pernicious statute in the name of the war against impunity that you could ever hope to see. Uh, this was a document actually originally drafted by my friend Otto Triftra, whose book many of you will have. Uh, Otto drafted it in the Max Planck Institute in 1972 with a colleague of, of his, and did a little Nuremberg model, which was all the rage at that time, and off it went to Dakar. And it was meant to prosecute people, the Pakistan prisoners of war, uh, and to be uh, an instrument of truth and justice. But there was a political deal, and the Pakistan prisoners of war went back, and no one was prosecuted under this little act that Otto had drafted. And... 2009, change of government, and we have the right-wing Anwari League coming in. Uh, they don't like the Islamic party, jamaat e islami too much, and they've decided to put the whole of the chief executive of the Islamic party all on trial for war crimes that happened in 1971. Um, I showed Otto the statute at, in Salzburg this summer when I was lecturing for him. And it wasn't his statute that he drafted at all. It was completely different. And what had happened here was that all the national rights that anyone would have under Bangladeshi law had been exported, i.e. taken out, and imported International Crimes Tribunals Act with international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, etc. But with no definitions, and no defence rights at all. Jamat brought this problem to me last year in June, and I looked at it, was horrified, and, and took another look at it. Um, but I noticed that very worthy international human rights groups were going around with paragraphs saying, we support the battle against impunity, bringing war criminals to justice, etc., etc., but no one had read the bleeding act. No one had looked at this thing. No one had put their brains together to see what was going on here. So the crusade against impunity, uh, and if you looked at the government's uh, websites, they were re repeating all these paragraphs and saying what good boys they were, signing up to the ICC, proud members of the international club, but they've got this stinking pernicious act back home where they put people on trial, the first trial has started, society, uh, and um, detained people without charge for over a year uh, and not allowed defence lawyers in for the interviews that the prosecutors have. You've got to prove your alibi, you've got to prove this. Absolutely pernicious. So what's going on there? The crusade against impunity has given a device to governments to subvert the truth crusade 
and justice and provide something that goes against justice. One last area, and it's the area I'm involved in at the moment, that's the Kenya case. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it, but that hangs on the definition of crimes against humanity, uh, a widespread and systematic attack uh, against a civilian population in, in pursuant of a state or organizational policy. What's of interest, though, is that the pretrial chamber have suddenly brought out a new definition of organizational policy that's never been in the law before, wasn't part of Nuremberg, wasn't part of anything before, uh, and made it something that a, a football supporters club could actually be put on trial at the ICC under crimes against humanity. So all Millwall fans, watch out tomorrow, behave yourselves. Because you're getting there, you're getting there, and Ocampo needs to get some credibility. Um, so that can happen. But what was remarkable to me was that Judge Call, the German judge, looked at this and said, no, state or organizational policy means what they said it ought to mean and what the founding fathers of the ICC said it was going to mean, and that's something with state-like qualities. But the prosecutor, pretrial chamber, two of those judges have now this new definition, some body or whatever, the, the basic human values test, we've called it, in our filings. Nothing to do with organizational policy, but there we are. That's what happens. That's what creeps. Why is that happening? Well, because they don't like violence in elections in Africa, so someone's got to be made an example of. We've got a problem in Kenya. Let's, let's put a trial on there and keep everybody quiet. Might be a good reason, might be a bad reason. But as I understand it, it's not the law and it's not what justice is about. If you have been listening, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay, Robert Murphell will now make uh, a few comments uh, for five minutes. Robert. And I will be short, don't worry. So, yes, hello, everybody, and um, thank you very much for coming. You know, so as Stephen mentioned in his introduction, so I'm largely the brain behind this event. And um, so we largely had to reorganize the panel, you know, as many of you learned uh, on very short notice as well, and so we had to reorganize our interventions as well. And so I'm going to keep it very short, and I just think I'm going to just tell you two little stories, like the story since yesterday morning uh, and the story since 15 months. So the story since yesterday morning is that Mr. Jacques Vergès uh, wrote to me and said that he had uh, caught a flu, you know, under the heavy temperatures in Paris. So. It was a little uh, shock, you know, so what should I do? So I had, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, um, possibility to call up Stephen, who was very kind, you know, when he answered the phone to actually step in, and uh, his first reaction was, hmm, so you're in the shit, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so at last minute resort, he actually helped me out to come in here, but then a much larger problem emerged. So, I mean, this event was largely set up as a trap for Jacques Vergès, and... I, you know, have only nice things to say to Stephen, whereas, you know, I didn't have those nice things to say to Jacques Vergès. And so the commentary, you know, on what the work of a defense council really entails and when do you overstep the line and what are your, you know, historical, you know, associations and who do you associate with is a very different story for Jacques Vergès than it is for many other defense council. Nevertheless, um, to point out, um, for instance, um, uh, with Jacques Vergès, one thing that would have been really more, far more clear in this room is uh, his association with, um, you know, the 8th of May 1945, uh, so the time when the Nazis were defeated and a massacre occurred in Satif, Algeria. And Jacques Vergès used this foundational moment to basically construct his entire career as a very radical attitude towards the uh, state of France and towards everyone else. 
So I'm looking forward to discuss that with Marty uh, later on as well, when we struck a little deal that uh, uh, we still will be representing certain opinions of Jacques Vergès tonight here in the discussion. And uh, yeah, so it was 15 months ago that I contacted Marty uh, to do this thing with Jacques Vergès. And uh, it had many, many, many uh, facets to it. And um, so, yeah, I'm going to look forward to your questions from the floor after our discussion has kicked off on the issues raised of the two speakers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, come in. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm actually uh, not, not maybe happy that Jack Vergez didn't make it, but, um, but having worked on the other side of, uh, of Stephen, I'm, uh, I'm quite excited to, uh, to engage with you. Um, I'm honored to be sharing the stage with uh, Marty Koskimemi, whose, uh, whose, whose textbooks I think uh, every law student has, and um, whose legal mind has really shaped and continues to shape the field of international law. And thank you all for being here today. I'm, uh, I'm deeply humbled. <laughs> I'd like to start off also uh, to telling you a little story um, about the moment that I realized what the value really was of international criminal justice. Um, as Professor Hopgood mentioned, I spent a year and a half working in the office of the prosecutor of the ICC. And uh, I started off really as, as a skeptic. For a year, I was part of the team that worked on the Kenya cases. Uh, we started off with uh, communications that victims had sent in, NGO reports, which I know Stephen takes issue with, <laughs> um, news stories. But, and as the allegations mounted, we, we started realizing what exactly had happened in Kenya over the span of three months in 2007-2008. Um, and the investigators eventually collected enough evidence that uh, the violence had been organized, and so we applied to the chamber for summons to appear for six individuals. And those were the six individuals that we thought were the most responsible for the full range of crimes that had happened in Kenya during that period. As, some, as you may know, a couple weeks ago, the, uh, the pre-trial chamber confirmed the charges for four out of those six individuals. So two of them are now free, unless, of course, of course the prosecution can appeal that decision. The other four will go on to trial. Um, all six individuals were prominent public figures in Kenya. But two in particular enjoyed almost a uh, semi-divine status. Uhuru Kenyatta, who is Stephen Kay's client, um, was the, the son of the father of Kenya, the scion of the founding dynasty. And William Ruto was a prominent politician from the Rift Valley, which is the agricultural engine of Kenya. Um, was without any irony on uh, the evening news and in daily newspapers referred to as the King of the Rift. Late last spring, the six suspects came to The Hague for their initial appearance. The initial appearance is a procedural, um, formal, rather dry event. The judges ask, uh, read out the charges and they ask each suspect to confirm that they are indeed the person who has been summoned to the court. The whole event lasted less than an hour, but the effect, I think, lasted much longer. Because that was the day that those individuals that had spent up their entire careers building themselves up to be untouchable, that was the day that they had to answer to a judge. There was no more mystery. Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto, that day onwards, they were just regular people who were subordinate to the rule of law. I was working in the analysis section, and one of the things that we had to do was to monitor the uh, public opinion of Kenyans regarding the work that we were doing. That day, the support for the ICC skyrocketed. Um, the ICC had done something that no court in Kenya had been able to do, and it proved that no one is above the law. Since then, the court has accepted almost 500 victims' applications, so I respectfully disagree with uh, Stephen Kay that the ICC does not serve the interests of victims. Like those of you who are students here at SOAS, uh, I'm, I'm part of the same generation, the generation that is, is, we're just starting off our careers, the generation that we won't just be building upon the former Yugoslavia and Nuremberg, but we'll also be building upon Rwanda and what we've learned in Sierra Leone, Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, Libya, and we're faced with a drastically different world. Um, to us, the idea and rhetoric of colonialist oppression, uh, we associate it with the dictators that oppress their own people rather than the colonialism of a bygone era. 
And to us, international institutions like the International Criminal Court, they are more than just an experiment. They, they are part of an enduring global social contract. But we are also not blind. And that is why we must quite genuinely and honestly ask ourselves the question of whether international criminal justice, is it achievable? And is it achievable through a permanent tribunal? Can we overcome the challenges of legitimacy of access and of wider acceptance of the court, both by the victims' communities and by the communities of, of those individuals who we are charging? Or must we simply concede that the only two options that we have is either impunity or show trials? And the question to us is of utmost importance because, and I, I hope I speak on behalf of others in this room, we want to end up on the right side of history. I look forward to discussing all of this with my eminent fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Polina. Okay, we're going to have a few minutes of response. First of all, Marty, and then I'll give Stephen the opportunity to say a few more words. And then um, you've all been very patient, uh, and we'll take, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from the audience, and we'll take those. So Marty, first. Every trial affirms and reaffirms a structure of power and preference in this world. It does this whether anybody wants this or doesn't want it. That is the way, the nature of criminal trials. I want to take on Stephen Kay's point about our no longer being in Nuremberg. I completely disagree with him. We are in Nuremberg every single day. Legal technique has been building around international institutions such as the International Criminal Court, the ad hoc um, criminal, criminal tribunals, and of course, universities and law schools, especially in the developed North. International criminal law has become a very technical thing, spreading as a, expert, as a field of expert knowledge all over the place. One effect that this turn to technique is, is to make the audience watching these uh, events believe that it's all about parking tickets after all. That there are these uh, respectable lawyers in their gowns putting forward technical points whom none of us, of course, really understand and whose relevance, whose relevance to what has happened in the past, say, in northern Uganda, seems very obscure indeed. There is the famous Arnui around, or there was the famous Arnui around the Nuremberg trials. The journalists left after a few months because, oh, who can take all this pleading and pleading and procedural points? We all know that the ennui is all over the place where international criminal law is being exercised today. When Yugoslavian populations are, have been or were interviewed in the aftermath, during the Milosevic trial and in the aftermath of the Milosevic trial, as to, well, what do you think about what's going on in The Hague? They say, well, what is going on in The Hague? We, what is the language they speak in The Hague? Who are these people? And where is The Hague anyway? Uh, there is a big structure of power, knowledge, expertise, institutions out there, slowly building itself up. A few people are being indicted, it's true, it's true. A few people, mostly Africans, of course. What is the, so I say, Every criminal trial affirms a structure of power in this world, a hierarchy of knowledge and of value. What is the structure of power, a hierarchy of knowledge and value, that this constantly expanding field of technical knowledge is affirming? We can think about this, I suggest to you, in two ways. We approach these problems when we think about uh, the Ugandan, uh, or the, about the indictment of al-Bashir, about the Lord's uh, Liberation Army, about Gaddafi. We can approach all of this from two different perspectives. One perspective is this. 
Oh, the world is by and large fine. We have some problems in the margins. We deal with this. We have institutions. We have expertise. We have men and women who've devoted their careers. They travel far and wide and then meet at congresses like this. But by and large, it's fine, and let's go and have a drink. That's what most of us, most of the time, think this way. That affirms one way to think about the world, one structure of power, of knowledge, and of expertise. There's another way to think about the world. Many people think this, that the world is a disaster. That the world didn't just happen to become a disaster. It's a disaster because of the practices that men and women exercise in this world. Because powerful men and women participate in powerful institutions. The deprivation, the misery, and the injustice of this world is not approached even by the international criminal law system. I'm afraid it enables us to look away from these things. Can I ask a quick question? Thank you. Sure. Before Stephen Kay kicks off. If we're still in Nuremberg today, yeah, um, how does the Barbie case compare to Nuremberg? Was it an improvement or actually was it getting worse in its standards? What do you think? Me? Yeah. So the Barbie case, I think, uh, was a completely different case from Nuremberg. In the Barbie case, at issue was the identity of France. And there were three propositions put forward in the, in, in the case. There was the proposition put forward by the organizations of La Résistance that the France we know, we want to remember and celebrate, was the France of the heroes, those who fought against the Nazis, Jean Moulin. There was another story that was being put forward. That was the story of Les Enfants d'Isieux, the children of the village of Isieux who had were taken away to Auschwitz on the last train. This is the story of France as a country of miserable collaborators, a country of victims, a history of sadness and cruelty. And then there was a third story, which was the story of France in the 50s and 60s, and uh, the 8th of uh, May, the France of colon colonialism, the France of the Algerian war and everything that took place in the Algerian war. The Barbie trial was a show trial. There were three shows that were being put on and different, different auditors looked at different parts of the show. It has to be understood in the French context, in the Franco-German context perhaps, uh, yeah, certainly in the context of the Holocaust and of human misery and heroism. Nuremberg, I think of in terms of uh, the victors celebrating themselves. Uh, if, you want to, if we want to go to detail, I can uh, continue on this. But um, Nuremberg, and to this extent, and here I will end, to this extent was uh, different from today, that it was the story of the Second World War, not the third one. Thank you, Marty. Stephen, do you want to make any other quick comments, and then yes. we'll take some questions? Um, <coughs> the UN ad hoc tribunals, and let's take the Yugoslavia tribunal, uh, which kicked international criminal justice off, were set up under Chapter 7, UN Charter, to maintain and enforce peace measures. A lot of you here will know Tardic uh, jurisdiction uh, judgment. Looking, looking at that at the time, as I had to wrestle with it, and looking at those words, and then looking for precedents, had they ever done this before, and uh, not seeing any, uh, and taking that argument, um, it was quite clear that the Cassese Appeals Chamber um, weren't ever going to listen to us, and that this was a railroad that was going straight ahead. And I, I remember, in fact, being in New York in uh, 1993 when it was being discussed. And I went to the New York Annual Bar Conference. 
and I was wondering where these powers came from, how, how they, they could do it, and there seemed a great deal of uncertainty in the air. Um, but if you fix your court with your judges, and Cassese, God rest his soul, was, was a, a lovely guy, a great humanitarian, etc. Um, you get the answer that you want. A and politically, international criminal justice was really born from a base of very doubtful legal precedent, but they wanted that. The court was structured to ensure the result was delivered, uh, and you look at the people who were there at that time uh, in the appeals chamber. A and as I've always said, they weren't going to vote themselves out of a job uh, like the Lebanon Tribunal at the moment. And so I think one has to realise that these events uh, come into our lives. They affect the lives of individuals. They affect the life of Dusko Tadic, who was made the example, the first example, and he was really um, a nobody. Um, I think even he, with his ego, would admit that, that he was a nobody, uh, a cafe owner in Kozaratz, and found himself there because that was what was wanted. Um, so uh, the, the, the resources out there that you have to face and confront as a defence counsel, I often feel like Don Quixote with Sancho Panza, and I'm on a donkey and I've got a twig, uh, and I'm charging at the windmills because I think the fix is massive behind the scenes that we have to face. And I'm afraid I saw that in the organisational policy reasoning of pretrial chamber two on the Kenya case because they stretched that definition in a way that no one had written about it before and even... Those people like Daryl Robinson are saying, yeah, this is what we want. I mean, the background and history ain't there, but this is what we want. But that's not their job to want, to want it that way. So what right have they got to walk into people's lives, countries, say you're going to run your country this way? And they don't know anything about Uhuru Kenyatta. They don't know anything about Ruto and, and what they do. They don't know it at all. They want an example. That's what it's about. Thank you, Stephen.